welcome to La Habra United Methodist Church. It's our 125th year. Uh, September of this year will start our 126th year, and you're going to hear all about the history of the church, and many of you have experienced this as part of your faith community, your faith journey. What a blessing to be here together on this wonderful morning. The scripture comes to mind from Zechariah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to live in Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. You see, God's promise for us 125 years ago was people from the West and people from the East coming together to be together in ministry. So many years ago, they had a vision for what faith would look like in this community. And here we are. What a testament to their vision and to the love that they had in their hearts for Jesus Christ. So we stand proud today in this community of faith to still be here after that many years. I told the kids in uh, chapel this week that it's a birthday party for the church, so if you wonder why we're celebrating. We'll, we, the kids sang happy birthday to the church in chapel, but we don't need to do that as adults. We just have to proclaim it. A few announcements before we move on. Um, we have a couple of celebrations of life coming up. Many of you knew Joanne Shroop, her celebration of life is on June 3rd, so please mark your calendar for uh, 11 a.m. on Saturday, June 3rd. And also for Craig McIntosh, who passed in March, the uh, family is in the middle of planning a beautiful, fun celebration of life for Craig, and that will be on Saturday, June 24th, so please also attend or invite anyone in the community that you know. Craig ran a business in this town for many, many years. People knew him. He grew up and went to La Habra High School, and what a wonderful, wonderful family. So please invite anyone who, in the community who knows them. Uh, next, on June 4th, our guest preacher will be uh, Reverend Jerry Oyang, and he's going to come, and you know, I always tease him about telling jokes, but he's a really good joke teller. So if you're in the mood to smile and laugh, come and hear Jerry that day. Pentecost is next Sunday, and we're having a baptism, so please come where you're red. And um, the Deavers family is planning a little reception right after, so please come and stay and, and participate. If you've never been baptized, I'm not going to make you raise your hand and con confess that right now, but come talk to me. Love to have this opportunity to make that commitment and, and celebrate that sacrament together as a church. Watch for more information on our summer series. We're going to read through the Gospel of John this year this summer in July and August, and there'll be a Bible study to go along. Um, the books will be here in a week or so. If you want to get an A plus in the class, you can start reading ahead. We also have some photos. I think this past week was Mother's Day, and um, we always provide a party for our residents at the Navigation Center over in Placentia. And if you haven't heard of the Navigation Center, it's a community for our unhoused neighbors here in uh, North Orange County. And so some of the moms who live there just wouldn't ha be able to have a, mo a typical Mother's Day like some of us got to have last week. So our wonderful team of mission, Susie and Bonnie, went over and decorated, took them apple cider, uh, sparkling cider, and cookies and cupcakes to celebrate Mother's Day. What a way to reach out to the community and what a blessing that we were able to support them and remind them that they are loved and that they are women of faith and of grace. With that, I'd like to say just a quick prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be together again. And Lord, bless and send your spirit upon us as we pray, as we sing, as we share, as we hear stories and, remind, and are reminded of the wonderful legacy of this church and community. Lord, may you bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. We have uh, uh, several dignitaries here, and I, I'm going to introduce them each as they come. But first and foremost, I need to in introduce our district superintendent, Reverend Sos uh, Sosaya Tiotani. He is here to be our preacher this morning. <laughs> Reverend Saya is a friend, and he is my pastor. In the United Methodist uh, tradition, pastors don't belong to the local church, they belong to the annual conference. And so because of that relationship, Pastor Saya has been my partner and friend and prayer partner throughout the last couple of years. And 
So sadly for me, he's being moved to the West District of the United Methodist Church and will be receiving a new district superintendent. So I'm so glad we got him right before he left so you all could meet him just in time. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce our councilman and I'd like to ask you to come forward. Councilman Darren McSarian. He's also mayor pro tem for the city of La Habra and we're so blessed to have him with us this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor. Karen, and thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful event. I, uh, I've never actually been on the campus before, I'm sorry to say, and I'm so overjoyed to finally visit now. I'm struck by this wording on the front of this uh, A Look Back in Time booklet. God has done and continues to do great things through this enduring community of faith nestled just below the hills in La Habra, California. And you probably read that, but I just love the way that sounds. And uh, it is so important to remember, too, that this city, which is actually 25 years younger than your church, uh, has a motto which is known as the caring community. And I think it's so important to point out that one of the most important com components of a caring community are the faith-based organizations that inhabit this city. And I think we have over 22 Christian churches in La Habra. And for a seven square mile area, that is an extraordinary number, along with all these wonderful nonprofits. And uh, Pastor Karen even mentioned the navigation centers. I want to just uh, take some credit for that because the city of La Habra partnered with 11 other cities in Orange County to create these navigation centers in Yorba Linda and uh, Placentia and Buena Park. And we're leading, actually, all of California in doing this because now folks do have resources if they're unhoused. Uh, unfortunately, we still have homeless folks who are either addicted or have mental illness issues, and those are tough folks to encourage to go to these navigation centers, but we never cease trying, and that's something I'm very proud of La Habra for doing. So anyhow, uh, again, this is, a, this is a wonderful organization, and I think that... Um, it's emblematic of what makes La Habra special because you do care so much. And anybody that's been doing this for 125 years is doing something right. So, you're, so, so God's mission is certainly being fulfilled through all of you, so thank you. And I'd like to read the proclamation that has been drawn up by the city of La Habra in honor of its 125th anniversary as a parish and in recognition of 125 years of history for those who helped build the parish community in La Habra. The City Council hereby congratulates La Habra United Methodist Church for its 125 year anniversary and wishes it many more years of success. And I'd like to present this to Pastor Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Take a picture. Yeah, I'm going to say, let's do that. I need a photo off. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'll, I'll wish you a wonderful service. My niece is actually getting married today, so I have to take my leave a little early. But, uh, I hope the reception afterward is wonderful as well. And so again, on behalf of uh, the entire city council and our mayor, uh, congratulations on your anniversary. And we've got a big birthday coming up too next year. It'll be the centennial for the city of La Habra in 2025. So we're just pikers though. We're just kids compared to you guys. So thank you again, folks. This morning's call to worship is in two sections. I will read the first section to you, and following that, you and I will read the second section together. O oh God, our deliverer, you led your people in 1897 who lived in La Habra to build a church that would be dedicated to you and to your mission of hope and salvation for the people of this city. Bless us today as we celebrate their vision and dedication 125 years ago. Lord, you have sustained this congregation through joys and through wars, depression, loss of health, loss of vision, changes in building, changes in leadership, changing names. But Lord, no matter the challenge, each day, each year, each and every decade, you have been faithful to bring your children closer to you because of that vision in 1897. Like the children of Israel, after 40 years in the wilderness, you provided and led those founding members to have a vision and build a solid foundation for the future of our church, always being dedicated to Christ. If you will now join with me 
Guide us, Lord, for today we are the people of your church. May we continue the legacy of love and hope that has established so long ago, that the lives of anyone who is touched by this church would more faithfully follow our Lord and Savior and be transformed in his love. Today, we rededicate this church and our lives to the work and service of Jesus' calling. May our ministry transform the world for his love. Today, let us rejoice in the glory of the promises made to them and to those to come in our generation. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please stand and join. I'm going to invite the Wesleyan Choir to come and join us up here for our opening song together this morning. Please sing and clap along as the Spirit moves you. This is Great is the Lord, and the lyrics are on the screen. those who don't know me or those who may not recognize me after all this time, I'm Gilbert Stones. I've been serving at Trinity Los Osos for eight years, but way back in 1984, I was appointed as associate pastor to La Habra United Methodist Church. Back in those days, the church was a large and strong church. We had a large junior high and a large senior high group. We had a very large acolyte program that was known throughout the conference. We had two separate services with two separate choirs and two separate choir directors and pianist first service and organist second service. Um, we had two separate bell choirs. Uh, the, uh, the one choir that would play most of the time and then there was a choir for some of us who were a little slower, Rachel played in the, in the primary bell choir and I played in the other one, and they were both very good. There was a lot going on in La Habra at that time. When I got there in 1984, many of the members of the church were recruited by H. Hansen, then the choir director, to act as stand-ins for the opening ceremonies of the 1984 Olympics. 
And a lot of people went down and spent a week doing various different things, standing in for celebrities or dignitaries so that all of the helpers could make sure that they got where they needed to go. Well, I have so many great memories of La Habra United Methodist Church and of the wonderful people that were there. And I know that some of you are still there. And so to those I know, I will say hello. Um, but I wanted to share with you uh, something personal and also somewhat of a parable. I know that there's at least one person who is going to recognize this. I have referred to this for 40 years as the Holy Hammer. It's a mallet that I've had in my wood shop and I've used it constantly over those 40 years. But I want to tell you why I'm mentioning it now. Back in the early 80s, one of the other things that the church did was every sun summer they would have Wednesday night hamburger fries. I don't know whether you're still doing that or not, but I do know that it was a very popular thing. We would have dozens of people come out every Wednesday and we would cook hamburgers and then everyone would bring potluck side dishes and share them. And we had a marvelous time and it was held under a beautiful tree that was by the fellowship hall. You'll notice that there is no tree by the fellowship hall anymore. That tree eventually grew to the point where it was so tall and so strong that its roots were pushing under the foundation of the fellowship hall. And that foundation was in danger of cracking. So the decision had to be made what to do. And the decision was made, the, really the only decision that could be made, that the tree had to be taken out. Some of you may remember that, and some of you re may remember that it was very traumatic to do that. There were so many people who were wonderfully emotionally attached to that tree, and they fought to keep it even at the danger, or at least potential danger, to the fellowship hall. And so it became a contention in the church, as things so often do. Well, the tree needed to come out. And many of you may have forgotten that it was ever there. And many of you who have come since I left never knew that there was a tree there. But this is a constant reminder of that tree. When the tree came down, <clears throat> partly out of just the thought that I could use some of it, but partly also out of a sense of puckishness. I decided to make a mallet out of parts of that tree. And the head of the mallet is from a large branch and the handle is from a smaller branch. Very simple construction. A hole through the, the head, the handle smoothed down and then carved around and a plug put in to spread it and hold it in place. And in 40 years, the head has never loosened or threatened to fall off. And I, I got to thinking that, you know, churches are an awful lot like that. You know, there are things that seem so major and so important and so urgent. And we take sides on those things and sometimes they cause hurt feelings. And I don't know of anyone in this particular case, but sometimes in those disputes, it causes one or two people to leave or even for a church to split, depending on what it is. And of course, right now, the entire United Methodist Church is in that kind of a situation. But I got to thinking, I got to thinking that even those things that can be divisive over time and with thought and care can be repurposed. And all of those relationships can be salvaged. We may never agree on everything. In fact, I can guarantee we'll never agree on everything. And we may never agree that 
this or that was the better course. But nonetheless, there are parts of it that will still remain and still have their usefulness, even as that wonderful tree that had to come down still has its usefulness. So as you're considering various different things and what you might think about them and do about them, remember that over time, God brings all things back together. I guess this was supposed to be a greeting and not a mini sermon. So once again, I just want to say thank you to all of the wonderful people of the La Habra United Methodist Church, those who make the stay for Rachel and I a wonderful time in our ministry and a place where we have friends that we made 40 years ago and still hold dear. And so God bless you in all of your ministry together. Goodbye. Good morning. On the screen, it says a brief history of 125 years at La Habra UMC. So I brought my book bag. I am going to reference um, Esther Kramer's book, La Habra, A Pass Through the Hills. And I'm going to reference the cookbook that is available, was made on the 100th anniversary of our church. And I'm going to reference this wonderful little book that Sally D. Berry and her family put together. It's, there are many of them out there. We are um, going to be charging $5, but there's tons of pictures, captions, and lots of interesting history. Uh, if you want to know who was pastor in 1965, it's all in there. So, just so you know. So, in the beginning, it was 1897, the Methodist Episcopal Church began meeting in the old schoolhouse, which was on the site of Washington Middle School today. A joint Sunday school served many denominations. The Methodists met with other congregations until in 1908, the bishop appointed a permanent Methodist pastor. Six years later, in 1914, the La Habra Methodist Episcopal Church was built at First and Main, across from the current city hall and post office. In 1922, 350 children were enrolled in Sunday school, and the average worship attendance was 120. A pipe organ was donated to the church in 1932, and a new hymnal was printed in 1935. As usually happens when a new hymnal is printed, several church members bemoaned the omission of their favorite hymns. <laughs> the church was known in town as the Little Pink Church until 1943, when a painting crew of members painted the church white, and it's white today. The church budget was $3,286.29. A baby boom and a building boom followed the end of World War II, and new members joined at an amazing rate. The need for a larger building was clear. In May of 1946, three members donated a plot of land on Central Avenue, which is now La Habra Boulevard. This property was sold to the school district and the current location on North Hyatt Street, which is now Euclid Street, was purchased. In 1952, groundbreaking for the Fellowship Hall was held. That's where we'll be going for the potluck. The WSCS UMW women raised funds to complete and furnish the kitchen. The hall cost $60,000 to build. Church services were held in the Fellowship Hall until the sanctuary was built in 1961. In 1953, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, using modern language and phrasing, was published. I received a copy at Sunday School in Iowa in 1955. Many concerns were voiced over changing the King James Version, which was thought to be the true Word of God. In 1956, a tractor was donated by the Methodist Men's Club for use in Africa. This donation was memorialized in the stained glass window on the north side. It's this first bank of windows, and if you can determine that it's a, a tractor, there are some palm branches behind it, too. 
Um, let's see. Then we bought a new per, uh, parsonage in 2000. Um, that was, yeah, right. 1957, and it was at 211 Greenwood. Once pastors started buying their own homes, the parsonage was sold, and the money became part of our endowment fund to be used specifically for pastoral housing expenses. In 1956, the church membership was 600, and a building campaign began to build a larger sanctuary. Groundbreaking was in August of 1960. The membership of the church had doubled to 1,200. In 1962, ground was broken for an education building. In 63, the two-story education building, which stands over there, was completed and a part-time minister of Christian education was hired. In 1964, the dedication of, <coughs> excuse me, the dedication of the Austin pipe organ, which is up there, um, took place. Church membership was 1,600. A new hymnal was released in 1965, and again, there were complaints of omissions of favorite hymns, but the younger members were happy at the addition of contemporary pieces. An active preschool began on the church grounds in 1968, and in 1968, the Methodist Church joined the Evangelical United Brethren Church to become the United Methodist Church. In 1972, the membership was over 1,700 people. A new building campaign was launched to build an administration building, and that was finished in the end of 1972. In 73, the 1898 Country Fair was held to help celebrate the Diamond Jubilee, 75 years of the church. As you heard Gilbert say, two services were offered, a contemporary service and a traditional service. Sunday school for all ages was held between the two services in that hour. <clears throat> a youth club for fourth and fifth graders met on Tuesdays. Um, UMY Def for junior and senior high youth met on Sundays. Two bell choirs were formed. We have a former bell choir director in our midst today. Um, <clears throat> ringing the newly purchased bells. The singing choirs included the Mary Singers for younger elementary, a youth club choir for older elementary. Um, community folk choir was formed for high schoolers and adults, and the chancel choir served those adults performing uh, more traditional music. The Austin organ was upgraded in 1979, we're getting there, for $10,000. <clears> the 1898 fair continued each November. The church newsletter was renamed the Vista, the youth were active in UMYF and in mission trips. They also participated in the Acolyte Fellowship Program, with many youth completing 100 hours of service at our local church and at annual conference services in Redlands. I believe we have some alumni of that in the audience today. We helped found and staff the Community Resources Care Center in the uh, 1980s with other local churches. We supported this work with food drives and monthly financial contributions. This work continues today as the La Habra Collaborative. We hosted an Orange County homeless overnight shelter for two weeks each year for several years, providing shelter, dinner, breakfast, and lunches uh, from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. each day. Our youth and adults traveled to Mexico, Louisiana, Alabama, Mexicali and the Hopi Reservation, rebuilding and refurbishing buildings. And I think there were others, but I didn't get them all. Um, a tutoring program for children at Walnut School met for many years in the Fellowship Hall and was a great outreach to many community students. The J Team, formed in 1984 for elementary children, continued as the Navigators. VBS was held each summer and now incorporates the preschool children and their teachers. <clears throat> we welcomed back, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me a minute. We welcomed back a former child of this church as our pastor when Doug Hudson was appointed here in 2014. He served until his untimely death in 2020. We survived the pandemic, shutting down the church and the subsequent rebuilding of our congregation. We developed a video ministry that now serves our homebound and those who have moved away. 
We continue to supply food to the La Habra Collaborative. We've reopened a Sunday school and are enjoying once again having children in our service. Our preschool is thriving, and the church and preschool are more involved with each other than ever before. Together we, as the church, will strive to continue to be an important part of the life of the city of La Habra for the next 125 years. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are so blessed this morning to have the legacy of love and caring and grace that you have bestowed upon this community. Lord, we ask that you would sustain us for another 125 years and that all of the prayers and all of the hopes and all of the dreams of every member, whoever was part of this community, whether they were young or old, Lord, may they be a blessing wherever they may be today. Lord, we're aware of the lives of this church and how it's touched the community, how it's served and how it's fed and cared for those. Lord, we are your hands and feet. So we ask that you would continue to strengthen us in this time and that you would remind us each and every day that the work is not finished. We still have work to do more than ever, Lord. The world needs your love. The world needs your kindness and the world needs your people to live out that great calling. So Lord, in this time, we ask that you bless this community for at least another 125 years and beyond and allow each and every leader, each and every heart, each and every soul to be touched by your spirit and by your grace. May we find you in your saving grace, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray that prayer you taught by saying, Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite my friend and brother, Reverend Don Rowe, to please come and share with us about his time here in Mahabra. It's great to be here today as we celebrate this anniversary together. And I was here from 1978 to 1981. So let's see, three years out of 125, those of you who are math majors, um, so about 3% of the time. But a lot of wonderful things went on during that period of time. First of all, um, I guess the best way to put it during my time here, I was like the staff groupie. And you interpret that whatever way you want. But, uh, but during that period of time, we started a number of groups uh, here at the church, or I continued with them, uh, youth club. And by the way, Kathy did a great job, don't you think? So, uh, we had an older elementary group called the youth club and we kind of tilled the ground on Tuesdays. And then we had the junior highs going on, and we had the senior highs going on. And, um, and already mentioned has been the Acolytes, which was, was quite a program here. If I remember right, Jim Crawl was uh, the head of that, and I was the number two Beatle fan compared to Jim Crawl. So anyway, wonderful memories of delightful times, delightful occasions uh, here at La Habra. Now, how many of you have ever been to the booming metropolis called Haxton, Colorado? Anyone here ever been to Haxton? Okay, that's great, because that means I can fudge. And this is a true, this is a true story. Haxton's a little rural community on the eastern plains of Colorado, about three and a half hours east of Denver, and 
I was asked uh, to preach on a given Sunday morning. I was a seminary student back in 1978, and I went over to Haxton. And uh, it was a little town, and I pulled up to the church, and those of you uh, who have watched Little House on the Prairie, you know what Haxton was, the church at Haxton United Methodist Church was like. And so I got to the church, and got out of the car and made my way to the sanctuary. And lo and behold, uh, a little girl was coming out of Sunday school. And uh, she had her story paper in her hand. And uh, she saw me coming out of my car, coming up to the church, probably about four years old. And my guess is probably went into the ordained ministry as a preacher. <laughs> well, a little girl looked at me rather suspiciously and she knew that I was not from Haxton because she knew everybody in Haxton and she knew I was not one of them. And she looked at me suspiciously, folded her arms like this and said, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so I told her what I was doing there and what I was gonna be doing that morning and she reported to me that she was just out of Sunday school and she had her story paper on Moses and I found out more about Moses than I ever wanted to know <laughs> because of that little girl, I'll never forget her. But the more I began to think about it, that little girl posed an absolutely wonderful question. What was I doing there? But maybe she was also in a sense saying, what are we doing here as a church? Well, you've been up to something for 125 years. And the American philosopher, Josiah Royce, once said very beautifully of the church, he said the church is the beloved community of memory and of hope. And I think that's a beautiful definition what it means to authentically be the church. The church called to be a place of remembering and a place of hoping. And when I think about this church remembering, well, almost to the very day, eight years ago, I was married in this church and uh, had my, just had my eighth wedding anniversary. And as I think about April's living influence, her living love. It's very much here in this sacred place and space. Not only remembering who we are, remembering whose we are, but also being a place of hope. That same little girl posing the question, what was I up to that day? I can imagine her also saying, she waking up in the morning and saying every morning, I don't know what's gonna happen, but no something's gonna happen. Well, that's what hope is. It's a living reality. It's a vibrant reality. It's an abundant reality. And that's who you've been and continue to be as a living church, the body of Christ, the people of Christ here in La Habra, California. And so together, we celebrate a very precious day. We, uh, we celebrate a very wondrous day. And the old adage becomes very, very real. The old adage, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Well, there's more going on here than just the sum of us all here. A larger reality, a nurturing reality, a creative reality that invites us forward to continue practicing the sacred art called Christian ministry. Thank you so much for this time together. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Our next song together this morning will be um, performed by us, the Wesleyan Choir, and you will be able to join us on verses 2 and 3. This is They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love, and the words are on the screen. Please stand and join us. We are 
possibly can. I'm sorry we can't be with you in person to celebrate La Habra United Methodist Church's 125th anniversary. When I was appointed to La Habra in 1999, I never dreamed that I would be pastor for 15 years. But it was a good match. I had a good staff and wonderful lay leadership. I have many memories of my time in La Habra, including creative worship, wonderful Wednesday barbecue dinners, lasting legacy campaign, choir shows, murder mystery dinner theaters, and the successful church auctions. One of the most memorable experiences I had as pastor were the mission trips that we did. We went to Biloxi and Ocean Springs, Mississippi, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. On our first trip to New Orleans, we arrived late at night, checked into our hotel in the dark. We got up very early in the morning because we had to drive to Biloxi to be there by 9 a.m. As the light came up in the dawn and we were able to see more and more things, all of the excited chattering in the vans came to a halt. And we drove much of that trip in silence. We Californians, at least most of us, had never seen that kind of hurricane damage before. I still remember the families whose homes we helped to rebuild. And I also have wonderful memories of the La Habra team members who went on those trips. Congratulations to the church for 125 years of ministry. That's quite the legacy. And I pray for many, many more for the La Habra con congregation. Aloha. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that you, they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus 
whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to these whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, from the words that you gave to me. I have given them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave to me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. Amen. How about another hand for the choir? Yes, yes. They have done quite a wonderful, wonderful job this morning. And we praise God for that. Kore keu for tap ke afio ai o tua ta ulo tolo tonga. Tap ke ho wek o fon wan. Tap ke ura kakai o tau fon wa. Tek mo tolo no ka toa. 
Oklo no ko e fareni ata ke fa kakato ai fa I have just started my short um, sermon this morning in the manner that is most appropriate for me as I would if I were in my native setting. In short, it is paying homage to God who is among all of us this morning, to the honorees present in our midst, including the first people of this land, and to all of you gathered in the house of the Lord this morning. And last, a request for permission to speak and gratitude for the privilege of speaking among all of you. I want to thank you all. Thank you, Pastor, for the privilege. And uh, as they say in my native language, Ekefekau to Asino, which means the task to be exact, preaching in 125 years, celebration is a sacred honor undertaken by a common preacher, and it is quite impossible for me to bring justice to this task. But the spirit of this saying and my hope is that my role is further diminished by the magnitude of this moment in history. I bring warm and special greetings from our bishop, Bishop Dottie Escobedo Frank and the cabinet of your annual conference, and with it, special gratitude to all of you for carrying out the ministry of this church here and beyond. 125 years is a true testament to your commitment and the commitment and devotion of those who have gone before you. This is indeed a sacred moment in this place, like the burning bush of the Old Testament it is sacred ground. So would you pray with me? Oh Lord, we stand on sacred ground, ground dedicated by saints to you 125 years ago. And on this very day, we continue to honor you and serve you in your church and beyond. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts today and always be acceptable unto you, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. The Christian calendar, and for that matter, the lectionary for me, is like an old trusted friend. Like a friend, it is always there, always in the right, always with the right words and the right time and it travels with you through the twisted ebb and flow of life. Sometimes the word or the message is not always obvious, but like a true friend would, you can take all the time you want to figure it out. Unless of course, like today, you have been asked to give a sermon. Well, Jesus is coming to the end of his time with his disciples. As you heard, all of chapter 16, Jesus is uh, preparing his disciples of, what, lay, of what, was, what lays ahead for the grief and pain that is coming. And here, we witness in one of the most glaring evidence of Jesus' heartfelt, heartwarming humanity. As the end draws near, his heart is obviously heavy. For one thing, the cross is looming very near. And on the other, he knows that he will be leaving his friends and his family. The depth of that burden he, is, he was carrying can be heard in his prayer. His longest prayer recorded in the Bible what some theologians refer to as the holies of the holies. Imagine, just imagine, the very one you and I pray to, praying for himself, 
for his disciples and for all that will follow him and for all who will follow him throughout the ages. That prayer also includes you and I this morning. The gift of this morning is beyond measure, a celebration, a thanksgiving, a commemoration of 125 years of life and of ministry. Indeed, words, words fall short, but there's a word from the lesson that in the text we heard today that I believe is uniquely fitting for this occasion. That word is glory. The word glory or a form of it is mentioned about at least five times in the five verses of what we have heard this morning from our text. The dictionary defines it as a high renown or an honor won by notable achievements, magnificence, distinction, splendor of great beauty. But the Johannan definition of the word glory is so much more than that. It is recognizing the worth of the worth or the character of something. If you recall some of you, the movie Glory is based on a true story of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment, which was a military unit made up mostly of African Americans. It's the story of their humiliation and disrespect and ends with a, with a heroic charge of Ford Wagner. To glorify something is to reveal its honor. They were pressed down by racism, but they broke through and they broke the Ford's wall, revealing the inherent, inherent courage, bravery, and valor. Likewise, when Jesus prays, glorify your son, and I will add, and daughters, so that your son and daughters may glorify you. He is asking God's presence to be revealed through the son and daughters so that the son and daughters may reveal the honor of the father. The very definition of glory appeared first in my little research in Genesis chapter 33 in a story about the golden calf. Moses needs affirmation from God. He wants a sign that ensures that God will not abandon him and demands in verse 18, now show me, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is from the New International Version. God doesn't just reveal His physical presence here; He reveals His character good, merciful, and compassionate. Like Moses' plea, Jesus' prayer this morning is yet another cry, much like the anguished words heard in the Garden of Gethsemane a few days later. Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Jesus knew he needed God's presence in order to carry out the task of redeeming the world. In its most basic level, his prayer, glorify your son, was a plea to help him carry out the task of dying on the cross and also so that he can rise again. Glory then. It's the fullest, in the fullest sense of the word, is a fitting word for today's occasion. 125 years, or 45,625 days, 
of being the hands and feet of Christ here in the city of La Habra and beyond into the world, much like the ripple effect of a little stone pebble thrown into a pond. As you have heard from the history, this church is 25 years older than the city of La Habra, which means that the church was there in the infancy of the city to help, to guide, to build, and also to hold the leaders to accountability. Prayers were lifted up here for soldiers for the end of the Spanish-American War and for every war that has plagued this world. I can only imagine the number of babies that were baptized here and the impact they have had in the world. The life events of weddings, birthdays, memorials, bits and pieces of lives lived out impacting, changing, loving, making a difference in this city and beyond. This church, your church, is deserving of high praise and honor. But glory is so much more than just praise and honor. As we heard in Jesus' prayer this morning, it is a cry for the strength to die, to be a sacrificial lamb, for a church to have survived for 125 years, there has to be many, many sacrificial lambs. For a church to have, and I know this to be true, in the ministries of care that have been carried out here, feeding, recovery, fighting for justice, teaching, and the list goes on. To be the hands or feet of Christ, is about dying to oneself and allowing Christ to live through you. <coughs> Excuse me. Glory, or put it in another way, God's presence has been revealed through this church. The people, not the building, not the institution, but the people throughout this past 125 years. And you, who now make up that church, your faithfulness, and through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, service, and witness is the manifestation of glory of God among us. I know that the present years may, may be some of the hardest in the life of the church. We have lived through a worldwide pandemic we have challenges on every front, from finances to members, membership. And the world around us seems to get a whole more dark and uglier, as I may put it. And we battle with oppression of all types, gun violence, wars, divisions, and the list goes on. Even in our own very, very own UMC house, we are broken with talks of disaffiliation and division. But friends, the word for today is yet true. Glory. God is still God, and God is revealed in you and me. His very character of goodness, mercy, and compassion is still the defining character of this church. Yes, it comes through selfless sacrifice, but God continues to be present. As I said earlier, the Christian calendar, calendar always informs our journey. Today we celebrate 125 years, but it is also Ascension Sunday. And we remember that day as Jesus ascended into the heaven, but God has never and will never desert us. Rather. It is in this very ascension moment a greater opportunity to journey with God through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit continues to work through you, through me, to write the next chapter of the life of La Habra United Methodist Church. And to end, I am reminded of the story of Sir Christopher Wren, one of the most 
highly acclaimed architect of the English history. One of his greatest masterpieces is St. Paul Cathedral in London, the seat of the Anglican Church of England. Its magnificence, opulence, and grandeur is, in, in a word, glorious. Most famously remembered is the site, for those of you who remember, the site for Prince Charles and Prince Diana's wedding. And in this church, many of England's royal family members and famous historical people are entombed in this church with great tombs and monuments in the church in their honor. But visitors to St. Paul's Cathedral in London will not find a grand tomb or monument honoring Sir Christopher Wren. What you will find if you go to this place is a simple tomb with a simple epitaph in Latin that reads, reader, if you seek a moment, a monument, just look around. Look around you. St. Paul's Cathedral was Sir Christopher Wren's glorious monument. This morning, if you come here to remember, if you come here to seek a monument, a symbol to honor, to memorialize, memorialize the 125 years of life, just look around you. Look around you. God's glory has been revealed in a magnificent 125 years of being. And today, God's glory is revealed in you, the hands and feet of Christ. My hope and my prayer is that you will find, that you will find it an honor to be, be part of this glorious tradition to play your part in being the church, even when you don't feel that there is any glorious tradition, to play your part, even when you feel there's no glory except for pain and sacrifice. But I can tell you, I know that Jesus have already prayed for all of us, so that you, so that I, so that you may bring glory to God, so that you may continue as a church for all time and eternity. In my prayer this morning, may you continue to do so and all say, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your sons and daughters so that all of your sons and daughters may glorify you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we close, we have one final hymn, and it's so appropriate to what Pastor Saya has been sharing, the faithfulness of God and the ministry of La Habra. I'd be remiss if I didn't just thank a few people. Uh, most of the leaders are named on the back of the bulletin. But I just want to say, if you shared today, if you did something today, if you made photocopies today, if you made iced tea today, raise your hand. Some of them are already over there. I want to, I want to thank you. And I want to ask your brother. But many hands make light work. And so I appreciate and I'm so grateful for being partners in ministry with you. I thank our guest ministers. Thank you, Reverend Saya. Thank you, Reverend Don, for being here with us this morning. What a blessing your presence has been. Why don't we stand as we sing our final song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. i
May God bless you and keep you. And may God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance and give you his peace. So leave this place. Know that you have been prayed upon. You have been blessed. Leave in his love and God's grace to begin the journey to glory of another 125 years. Go in his love and his peace. Amen.